All right, everyone. Welcome to Foresight Institute's podcast. I'm really happy to be joined here today by Adam Marblestone and Ben Reinhardt. And both of them have previously joined us in Foresight's discussions. Those can be found uh, on YouTube. And um, they have lots of slides, which are really interesting to look at. But if you just want to hear the two uh, speak in discussion, then I think this is uh, a good channel to do so. Um, we had two really, I think, really quite uh, eye-opening discussions with them. Both of them are working on projects that are interesting and uh, complimentary. Um, and so I encourage you to check out the YouTube video if this conversation uh, inspires some interest uh, in uh, in their focus areas. Uh, maybe we just start with uh, either of you or uh, ideally both introducing themselves um, briefly and, you know, maybe Ben, would you like to, to start? Sure. Um, I'm Ben Reiner. I am working on basically creating a, a private ARPA, okay. so this is for Advanced Research Progress Agency. Um, the goal is to work on coordinated uh, research programs that are a little bit too researchy for startups and too engineer coordination heavy for uh, for academia um, with sort of the explicit goal of, of trying to, to work on areas like of, of physical technology that are potentially what I call dual use between um, Earth-based, that, that help things on Earth, but also could be very useful in space. Um, so that's... That's me. Great. Uh, well, I'm Adam Marblestone. I'm, I'm also, you could say, working on a somewhat related set of questions about institutional and funding structures in science and, and somewhat related gaps um, of this idea of sort of two researchy for startups and, and, and two systems coordination oriented for, for uh, academia, um, but with a slightly different angle. Uh, we're working on trying to galvanize the creation of a set of projects that uh, we're calling focused research organizations um, across a few different fields, um, slightly different and I think complementary to the ARPA model. Um, and formally, uh, I'm now the CEO of a new nonprofit entity called Convergent Research that we created um, as part of the Schmidt Futures Network um, to fund uh, the first two uh, uh, Schmidt Futures funded FROs. Um, and also, I'm a consultant for the Astera Institute, where we're working on uh, longevity-related projects and and potentially other uh, sort of fro-shaped projects. Wow, fantastic! I didn't even know. Congratulations, uh, first of all. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe also, Ben, do you want to say a little bit about your background and uh, and maybe also how you got into the space, like the fact that both of you are tackling um, you know complementary pr uh, problems. Uh, how is it that the two of you met, uh, and um, and what it what is it? that um, that you think is going suboptimally right now in the way that we do R&D um, and uh, and how are your projects um, already? To, to answer one of the last questions first, I actually don't remember how we met. Uh, I think it, 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 Adam can correct me, but I feel like it's one of those things where you just like start seeing someone around on the internet and eventually like reach out to them. I remember at, at some point, uh, I think I, I maybe I read, oh, that's what it was, I, I read, um, a couple of things that he'd done, there's, there's like some lecture that you did at MIT as part of a course, um, that was really sort of addressing, uh, talking about, uh, the idea of like road mapping technology. And I found this extremely inspirational. And so I, I think I, I reached out and it was just like, Hey, like, let's, let's talk. Um, and, and one thing led to another, um. Yeah, I don't actually remember either. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's actually how good friendships are. Is like you're just like, I don't know, we're we're just folks now. Um, uh, in my background is very like I have a, I'm sort of like a weird mix of a historian and a roboticist, um, and I sort of found myself leaping from one institution that's supposed to enable more awesome sci-fi stuff to another, uh, from like academia. Yeah, to NASA, to startups, to VC, and found them all sort of lacking, and that they they had a set of constraints that seemed to be constraining out a set of activities that I thought were very important. Um, and so uh, that sort of led to the conclusion that oh, well, maybe we need new institutional structures to enable these activities, and here we are. Well, maybe let's start with what? Why is R and D interesting? And you know. I mean, you already said creating awesome sci-fi, uh, sci-fi futures, but what, what is it exactly? Why do we need it? Why do you guys care so much about this? 
um, and what's currently going suboptimally that you think, uh, you know, we could be doing a bit better? Well, I think maybe we should each answer that in, in our own ways. I mean, I, I think that the, perhaps a shared observation that, that we both have is that there are parts of the research system that are, are going fine, uh, perhaps, um, but that we have pr maybe prematurely standardized on a certain relatively limited set of institutional models for, for carrying out R and D projects. Um, and that means that, um, there are some projects that we simply can't do, or, or it would be just unreasonably difficult to try to do now. Um, and in particular, you, you can kind of point to the sort of university based, uh, professor led, uh, research small research lab that receives funding from a centralized federal agency, um, kind of on a, on a per project basis, um, for, you know, a few grad students or postdocs kind of scale of projects, um, in the academic model. And then on the other hand, we have a lot of startups pursuing new technologies. Those are kind of the dominant go-to ways for a scientist or technologist to pursue their visions now. Um, and maybe that's just not not every project fits in that category and yeah. And can you give us a few examples of like what were historical things that make you really hopeful that actually we can do it? Um, like what are, what are inspiring examples that, you know, really show like the things that we're capable of if, uh, if we cooperate well? I mean, uh, and I think there, there's some, some, they're, they're almost like tropes at this point. Um, but like the transistor is sort of like your, your canonical example of what I would argue is a incredibly impactful invention that could not be created now, uh, because it sort of required this mix of people simultaneously working on theory and just like grinding in the machine shop and talking to each other constantly. And because uh, as as Adam pointed out, because it's sort of the, the dominant models, nobody's incentivized to do that. Um, and so I think that that's, that's one example, uh, but that, you know, it's like you sort of look around wherever you, if you're, you're in a built environment right now and everything from like the materials, you know, it's like the plastics that are, are probably around you to, uh, the, the screens to the, uh, the thing that you're listening this on, um, I think I would argue are all products of, um, a set of activities that don't, wouldn't quite fit into the, the current institution models. Yeah. You know, I, I would, I would also point even to some, some examples of, of historical successes that, that do require the kind of tight knit you know, systems coordination that, that we're interested in. I mean, uh, mRNA vaccine just coming up recently as very heavily as a result of, of DARPA or sort of DARPA involvement, um, in some ways kind of rescuing a, a field that was otherwise very poorly supported. Um, and also then later, you know, flagship ventures very deliberately incubating and kind of nucleating a goal driven company that, that would do mRNA vaccines and, and that required a pretty large scale of, of sort of upfront work to do. So that, I think that's a big success story. And another one that people point to is, um, that I think it's 2015 Nobel prize, um, was for this laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory LIGO that detected gravitational waves for the first time. That was like a many decade, um, very coordinated, um, difficult project to do, um, that required its own engineering team and its own scientific team. Um, and really shows, I think what what the physics community was able to put together just for a pure basic science question. I think actually to, to riff on that one, I think perhaps I'm guilty of this. It's like over-focusing on the technology piece of it, on like how this coordinated effort can, can lead to better technology. But you also see it sort of really the other way, like, uh, the way that we discovered the cosmic microwave background is that you actually had some people trying to, to build like useful technology at Bell Labs and they went and like, we're trying to get this, uh, this, uh, this microwave antenna working and they just couldn't get this noise. They couldn't denoise it. Um, and so, so you actually, the, the, the tight 
integration uh, doesn't just lead to, to better technology, but we, we've seen that it also historically it's led to new scientific discoveries as well. Well, what a nice collateral benefit to <laughs> discuss it. Um, okay, lovely. Well, so now let's maybe drill a little bit deeper into how is it that each of your projects, uh, Popper and FRO, uh, are trying to um, and trying to yeah help, and how are they complementary? Uh, so, with that, Parpa's trying to help is that we're the so the, to just give you an overview of, of the way that the, the model works is that you have a extremely powered program manager who's basically the CEO of the program. They can spend money however they want. Um, they go and they first sort of put together a a program design. So say okay. Like, this is, this is our goal as precise as possible. These are the different groups that uh, will work on these different projects. This is sort of how, how it's going to take, uh, how long it's going to take. Um, and then they go and uh, first fund a few initial sort of deep risking experiments on a different parallel paths. So in, in uh, various organizations, whether it's, it's startups or labs or, um, you know, it's like contract research companies, and then eventually move on to a, a bigger program where they're sort of funding a number of uh, sort of parallel projects and coordinate and making sure that there's there's coordination between them. And so, uh, one one way that it helps is because it's private, it, it lets us be a little bit less responsible than the government. Um, and the, the one of sort of my my core hypotheses is that there's there's this fundamental tension in government managed research in the sense that one, uh, at least here in the United States, you, you, the government is funded by taxpayers and you sort of want them to be responsible with your money. At the same time, uh, doing really sort of groundbreaking work often requires acting irresponsibly. Uh, so there's a fundamental tension there. So, so that's one. Another is, uh, I, I think it actually sort of goes against the dominant paradigm, which is sort of having very opinionated funding in like sort of like top down, um, managing it as opposed to just saying like, okay, like send us proposals for projects and we'll fund them. Um, I think that the, the coordination piece is important and underdone. Um, and, and the three just sort of like explicitly going out and trying to look for areas that don't make that, that just are not incentivized and sort of like filling in that gap. Um, and then the way that they're complementary is that you could almost imagine uh, that an ideal outcome for a type project would it be that eventually these these sort of like parallel tracks all sort of converge on uh, a, a a project that needs to sort of go all under one roof, and you could very easily imagine that the ideal outcome of a type project would actually become uh, an FRO. So, and this is a great yeah. time to pick yeah. back. What is an FRO? Great, great, yeah, absolutely. So, and I think it, I think it's a great way to introduce it also. Um, because it is targeting this, in some ways, this, this same type of issue of projects that require a kind of very coordinated effort of, of, of multiple people, a whole team to develop something, even at a very pre-commercial, uh, stage that one thinks of as still fun, kind of fundamental research or tools to enable fundamental research. Um, so I think there are going to be many, many problems that might fit this ARPA program model where what, where what you do is you have a, a relatively lightweight internal organization, often just a program manager and a couple of uh, kind of advisory staff or, or, or things like that. Um, and what they do is they distribute funding to a bunch of external existing entities, uh, but they do it in a way that galvanizes those entities to coordinate with each other and reach for stretch goals or identify um, types of systems that they could develop that they wouldn't develop on their own in the absence of that funding and that coordination. Um, I think that will work for many, many problems. I think there's a subset of problems that require such tight knit coordination, particularly at later stages where you're trying to build a very reliable and robust uh, system or process, um, not just to sort of demonstrate uh, that that it's such a process is possible, but to, but to actually really refine it uh, down to a, to a working implementation where you, to some extent, you need more people under one roof. And so, and so the inspiration for these focused research organizations is really 
uh, less an ARPA program and more something that is functionally looks a little bit like the, the internal structure of, a, let's say, a Series A, a biotech or kind of deep tech startup where it has a CEO, it has op internal operations, it has management, it has a, a permanent, you know, scientific staff, although, although the froze themselves would also be time bound, uh, projects uh, that are sort of very much driven by a particular goal rather than any, uh, sort of commercial or, or financial, um, markets and they're just defined by a particular goal. So you can sort of think of a fro as like a little bit like an ARPA program under one roof or a, a, a often targeted for a slightly later stage system development. Um, but still in the, in the realm of pre-commercial research or enabling tools. Thank you. Uh, okay. Lovely. Um, so now that we, I think have a little bit of the theory down and I would just suggest to everyone who's interested in this, uh, you know, if you want to actually look at the structure of both of these organizations and there's lots written on, um, Adam's and on Ben's website, and maybe we'll get into the particular funding structures again, you know, later in this conversation, if we find time, but I think maybe to color it in a little bit of like, how would those programs actually work? And maybe let's take an example and no better example to pick than the one that we had a discussion uh, a few weeks ago, uh, about, uh, and so maybe, you know, Ben, you can kick us off with what do you find particularly interesting <laughs> about artificial molecular machines and, uh, how could a proper like structure go about building them? Yeah. So. The, I, I mean, like the, the thing that's interesting about them is sort of like the long-term vision in my mind is, is like, I, I think that, you know, it's like you, you look at Feynman's, uh, there's plenty of proof at the bottom paper, this, this idea of like, we could, uh, ideally with them um, just like control matter at a atomic level, right? Like that's, that's exactly big and like, what could we possibly do with that? Uh, like big materials you could never imagine. Uh, make the things that we can make now with like, much less energy or much different situations. Um, so that's, that's like why they're exciting. Why I think that the, uh, I, I think they're particularly exciting through the lens of like a park program is, um, so, uh, how, how familiar are people with, uh, artificial electrical sheets? Like, should I, should I say like, give them a brief, what we're talking about? Yeah. So, so basically the, the, the idea said, there is, that, yeah, is that, is, is that there's, um, there, there's a whole lot of, uh, different sort of mechanisms that at, at sort of molecular level, you can do things that you'd sort of imagine like a macro scale, uh, machine doing like moving something from one place to another or like spinning or, uh, or pushing, um, and so there's, there's this sense that we should be able to like combine all these machines together into a molecular factory, say, um, and the reason that I think that it's, uh, worth looking at from the perspective of, of, of PERPA is that it feels like there's all these like really high potential Lego pieces and everybody is, is working on their particular Lego piece, uh, molecular machine and there's sort of like this idea that they should be able to be combined into something amazing. But the, the problem is that people are not incentivized to combine them. And there's not a good sense of like, even if you put them together, like what is the picture on the Lego box? Um, and so the hypothesis is that we should be like with a, a little bit of, you know, coordinated, um, so coordination via funding and management. Uh, we should be able to figure out what, uh, what we could actually combine them to do and that incentivize the work to, to do that. Okay. That's nice in a nutshell. And what does an artificial ribosome have to do with that entire thing? So, so artificial ribosome is, is sort of the, the catchy term that I sort of, uh, stuck all of this under where if you look at the ribosome, which is, um, the cells. Uh, machinery for producing, for, for taking RNA, uh, which comes from DNA and turning it into, to proteins. Um, it, you can sort of abstract away from what it does, which is stick together, uh, the, the canonical amino acids and say, look at it from sort of like a, an architecture, uh, view. Um, at the end of the day, my brain works like a systems engineer. So I look at it and I say like, okay, like what, what is this thing? It is, I think that take that is programmable, right? Like you program it with the RNA and it takes 
uh, native scale building blocks, which are the, the uh, amino acids, and it creates covalent bonds between them and then uh, releases them into the environment. And so the, the, I, I think a, a compelling framing on like what to do with molecular machines is to say like, okay, could we recreate this architecture? Um, but with things that like e e are w without it being limited to recombining uh, the canonical amino acids. So you could possibly uh, create uh, 2D structures instead of 1D structures. You could possibly use um, non-canonical amino acids or just completely non-amino acid building blocks. Um, and that could lead to us be able to do many more things than what we could do just proteins. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, you know, and again, if you are interested in more of this, uh, check out the YouTube video that we did on, um, uh, on this topic. And I think from Adam, you know, um, in that YouTube video, you have this amazing slide where like Ben is like, imagine it is a program that uh, so make, is, is a ribosome that makes something like but and then fill in the blanks. And so Adam, can you fill us um, in yeah. with, uh, things to fill in those blanks? Yeah, I'll say a few things about this. So, so one thing is I, I think that this artificial ribosome idea is actually very good as a kind of PARPA program it, it, in, 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 in this sense, as opposed to an FRO, as opposed to other kinds of projects, because it really is a, a kind of broadly interpretable idea of sort of how would you put pieces together to make something like the ribosome, this natural machine that makes all the proteins in our cells, but uh, different in some way or made artificial in some way. And, and you can imagine a PARPA type program catalyzing researchers at all sorts of existing institutions who work on pieces of this to sort of say, well, hmm, well, maybe we could make something that would actually make a different kind of polymer than protein, or maybe we could make something that would be two dimensional instead of one dimensional chains. Um, at the same time, um, like in my mind, I think it's interesting because there are certain kinds of systems within that class that seem to have some real technological interest. And like, you know, this is the Foresight Institute. When I was a kid, I was reading about nanotechnology and molecular assemblers and those kinds of ideas. And um, if you think about what that involves, I mean, it basically involves being able to direct particular covalent bonds between particular um, small molecules, let's say, um, to form in a particular pattern using some sort of positional or spatial control or some kind of programmable control, as opposed to just letting those molecules bump into each other and basically forming all possible bonds that they could possibly form with each other consistent with sort of steric, you know, hindrance of, of what their shapes are, which is more like the self-assembly or, or kind of traditional chemical synthesis paradigm, right? So you, you kind of want to have directed assembly that also does make specific covalent bonds between specific molecules, um, right down at the molecular level. And if you think about it, if you start with the ribosome and you sort of keep changing things, so it, maybe it doesn't have to just make one dimensional chains of amino acids. Maybe it could make 2D covalent assemblies of things other than amino acids. Maybe it wouldn't just use an RNA to program that assembly. It could use an external, you know, control system that could shine different wavelengths of light or change the salt concentration or things like that in the, in the solution to, to tell it how to move along each axis of two or three dimensions to basically print, you know, which building block goes where. So if you sort of generalize this idea of the ribosome enough, you actually get something that looks like a molecular 3D printer, um, which, you know, in turn, it kind of seems like of, of real interest potentially in, in nanotechnology. But then on the other end of that spectrum, you're really just starting with kind of ideas that already existed, you know, out in fields of sort of saying, well, you know, what if we could get a few of you people to collaborate together more, you know, make something more ribosome like, um, so this sort of, you sort of just have a path from where we exist in the academic fields that exist now to something that looks more like a, an interesting system. Um, and that's, I think that's exactly why that would be a good as an example of a PARPA uh, type program. Totally. I mean, it clearly sounds really interesting, but like as a lay person, why would I care? What's the, like the elevator pitch? Like what kinds of applications? I think, you know, like Ben, you already mentioned, like what's on top of the Lego box? Like what, what would be on, what, what would be on the Lego box? Like what, what, well, how should I benefit and when? <laughs> so the, the thing that I want to flag is like the, that attitude is, I think one of the, like, if I could answer that question in a very compelling way, then I could start a startup around it. Okay. So, so like, that's, that's the thing that I, I, I want to flag and the sort of work that needs to be 
done is like, we don't even know what the affordances of the thing would be. So I could, I can like say a few things, um, that are hypothetical, but like the, 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 the sort of like message that I want to get across is like sometimes like, so for example, uh, transistors were like, we thought that they were going to replace vacuum tubes in underwater sea cables. Um, and that would not be very exciting to anybody, uh, because they had no idea that they were going to be able to be used for computers. So, um, that being said, uh, like some, some very concrete things, it's just like, imagine what proteins could do right now. Uh, and then imagine being able to do those things with different constraints. So for example, like proteins do like catalyze all of these reactions. Um, and they, so, so like proteins are like really good catalysts and they can uh, do all these things, but they denature, um, under pretty low temperatures comparatively. Um, and they're huge, um, because they, they need to use these like 1D chains to fold up in order to get a 3D active site. So if you could imagine a way of creating that same active site, uh, but much smaller, that they, they would be able to, uh, that, that catalyst would be able to go places uh, that, it, that it currently can't go, like cross a blood brain barrier, for example, um, or uh, working in much harsher conditions than proteins can act. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, another is like, you can sort of imagine like what do also like proteins do well, they make like all these like incredible materials. So, like what if we could create like tunable wood, right? Like wood is one of the most amazing engineering materials that exist. Um, it's created just by, uh, by cells and, uh, imagine if you could actually like, uh, tune it to, to have properties that you want. Um, I think those would be two concrete examples. Okay, I'm sold. Cool. Adam, uh, unless you have anything to add, um, you know, we, yeah. No, I largely agree. I think that one of the struggles with this molecular 3D printer idea is it's, it's distinctly unclear how, how good the first ones will be. They, and it, it's, it's not at all clear that the first molecular 3D printer you make would be good enough to make the next molecular 3D printer even better, for example. And so it is actually inherently quite difficult a path, um, you know, to, to go on, but I, that doesn't mean we shouldn't go on it because I think it is potentially exploring a whole new area of, of fabrication, but also that it, more generally the artificial ribosome idea has these other kinds of, you know, potential avenues that like that Ben was talking about. So lots of collateral uh, benefits that we may expect, <laughs> who, who knows what we'll discover next. Um, okay. So let's say we have artificial ribosome as one potential. Uh, example, I think, you know, you, we really got quite concrete there as well. Uh, but, you know, you surveyed uh, a variety of different areas. So I'd be super curious uh, what else uh, you uncovered here. And uh, I think, uh, Adam, you know, you're particularly interested in a topic that's also very close to Fawcett's heart, uh, apart from <laughs> molecular machines, which is uh, longevity. And um, um, could you tell us a little bit about your process there and uh, what you uncovered? Yeah, well, I can actually tell you now we, we have, I would say it's, it's almost a fro it's, it's kind of a, you, I think if we're being super honest about it, it's a fro inspired project getting launched on longevity called the rejuvenome. Um, and I, I think that it, uh, this is funded by the Astera Institute, um, and is, is also, uh, you know, going to be partially executed out of the Astera Institute and then partially in collaboration with the Buck Institute, uh, for research on aging that the Astera is, is funding and partnering with. Um, so this is sort of a, a fro shaped project in the sense that it requires some dedicated management and kind of full-time staff to be spun up, uh, in a bespoke way. Um, not, it's not an existing facility or something that, that just does it. You, you sort of have to, to spin up the management and the goals and everything and the leadership in a, in a, in a bespoke project specific fashion. Um, it's, it's sort of very goal driven and it's, it is something that is at a level of scale that it's not, it's not well incentivized for any one particular, you know, student or postdoc to have that be their PhD thesis or their, their individual publication. Um, it's really a, a, a sort of systems or, or kind of large scale, kind of medium scale science, I think is the way you would describe it. Um, so, so what is it? So, so the basic observation, um, again, because of the way that academia is funded, you can think of it this way, um, where you have many different individual labs pursuing many different individual scientific hypotheses and they sort of need to be going for scientific novelty for each thing that becomes someone's PhD thesis or, 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 or tenure package or so on. 
in the academic world, that is mostly the world that's, that does aging biology research um, of a fundamental kind, as opposed to, let's say, drug development for particular compounds or things like that, that industry is doing more. Um, in that world, you have this problem that like, let's say I'm studying, you know, uh, a particular molecule that might affect the aging process. Well, in a particular lab, I might be a lab that studies aging of the brain. So I might just look at the brain or I might have another lab, um, that looks across the whole body, but it's an RNA biology lab. So it only looks at RNA. It doesn't look at protein. Um, so with the rejuvenome, basically we're just trying to create a systematic pipeline that will look at all of those things for a set of aging interventions. Um, and we'll do it in genetically diverse mice across their age, uh, across their lifespan. Um, and it will basically try to understand what are the kind of axes of variation? What are the different kinds of ways you can affect the aging process? Like you imagine you have the old state, you have the young state. There's a huge number of differences between them. We don't really understand what causes aging or what's really going on. There are various theories about it at different levels of abstraction, but we don't really understand. So you have this huge vector, this huge complicated state of the system that's old and you have the state that's the system that's young. Um, if you do different perturbations to the old state, you know, what are the different directions you can go? If you combine perturbations, can you chart a path where you sort of make your way back to the young state? It's not enough to just ask about the liver or the kidney or some particular thing to do that. You have to actually look at the whole body and you have to look at across genetically diverse animals to be able to characterize that. So that's what the rejuvenome uh, is going to do. Um, and uh, that is now something that has come into existence as a result of this kind of road mapping process that, that Ben and I like to do. Um, this one was in collaboration with Jose Luis Ricon uh, and several others, um, and is now, now led by, um, uh, uh, Nick Shom, who was previously doing one of the previous larger scale aging projects at Stanford. Um, so that we sort of charted this process of identifying a gap and then building not exactly an institution, but a, in this case, it's sort of halfway between a fro and a PARPA, um, type project. Wow. Well, uh, you have to come up with a name, which is when the two marry. <laughs> Like a frappa, I don't know. It's not good at it. Special projects. <laughs> um, no, but you know, I remember when uh, when when um, Jose and you presented to our group like a year ago about this. Probably a lot has changed, so I, I I'm sure that you know if people want some initial understanding of that project, they could maybe go back into their presentation. But probably there's lots uh, lots of uh, of new and more updated uh, stuff that uh, that will be published soon at the organizations that you just mentioned. Um, are there any other projects uh, that you'd like to add? Is there anything you want to bring to people's minds? I mean, you can only have your, your eyes on so many balls. What, what should other people spin out on? Or if nothing, then is there anything uh, particularly interesting that you learned along the way that where you're like, this is interesting. Oh no, it really isn't. Like any learnings here that you want to share for fellow people that go down the same path? <laughs> Oh, um, so, I mean, PARPA is working like that, that the artificial ribosome, it's only one of several programs that we're looking to start. Um, frankly, like the, the thing that we're bottlenecked on is amazing program editors. Uh, I have a giant list of programs that I would love to run and I am extremely limited in my ability to come up with or discover ideas. So, uh, that's. So, so it's, it's certainly not the only thing, everything from, uh, general purpose tele robotics to, uh, like pulling to, to make useful products out of carbon dioxide in either the atmosphere of Mars or the earth, um, to, uh, like artificial cells. Cause like the artificial ribosomes need to, to work in a, an enclosed out of equilibrium location, um, to, uh, the idea of like atomic forges, um, all sorts of things. Uh, so there's, there's sort of no limit there. I think one lesson that but maybe it's like, I, I knew this, but like, I, I learned it ever more so is that like in, incentives matter. Um, and so really sort of thinking about what is going to like the, the people that you want to work with, regardless of the, the project is like thinking about what really motivates them. And, and at the end of the day, it's, it's still all about people. Like we like to talk about research as like this kind of abstract thing and it's like, oh, and there, there are papers 
and then the paper, like the papers are knowledge and that knowledge combines to make more knowledge. But at the end of the day, it's about people and their idiosyncrasies and what they want to do. Um, and, uh, I, I think actually, uh, if I can say like one sort of like interesting meta learning is that I, I think that this like sort of idea about this economist idea that like people, um, just want more money, right. And are incented by, by more money is, I think it's completely wrong and that people like people want to be able to have a family and kids and like live where they want and they want enough money to be able to do that. And, uh, but beyond that, they like really want to work on like awesome stuff. So we, we sort of like figuring out like that sweet spot is, is a big trick. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I should say we're, we're very actively seeking, um, you know, again, there's sort of these, these two entities that have expressed interest in FROs. Um, so far, one one is this this new convergent research nonprofit uh, that's part of the Schmidt Futures Network, which will both uh, help to incubate the first two FROs that we're doing. One one through that mechanism. One is on uh, brain mapping technology, and one is on synthetic biology tools for sort of non model microorganisms or organisms other than the, the typical ones like E. coli and yeast that are, that mostly get used and published on. Um, but you know, it's also going to be working on actively finding and, and incubating more. Uh, and then also, you know, the Astera Institute has on its website, it is also, uh, in addition to PARPA, uh, at, as a concept, al also interested in finding more fro. So we're, we're very actively looking for them. I would say one of the things that I'm struggling with on that front is like, generally I'm very techno optimistic and a, a sort of all, more technology is, is, is good. And, and, and we want to have more tools in our tool belts, uh, always. Um, but I'm also trying to think a lot about sort of responding to this, like if you want long-termist critique of, of tech development, which is to say, well, you know, it really depends on which order you do things. So if you make something where synthesizing viruses right and left, that might be great for gene therapy. And actually gene therapy might in turn be great for getting off the planet and averting certain kinds of risks. But this might be particularly bad for, you know, engineered pandemic type risk if people get really good at synthesizing viruses. So we're probably not gonna do an FRO on synthesizing viruses, even though, you know, that that might be helpful for some things, but but we might, we very much be looking for something like a really advanced sequencing technology to help us detect uh, the next pandemic before it starts. Um, so I think that's another meta level question. If we really do get to the point where we can sort of shape more which technologies come out when beyond just the usual market forces, um, then uh, we have a lot of responsibility to sort of choose those uh, well. Um, so that's that's something that is definitely going to be top of mind also for us. Can, can I riff on that slightly? And it, it, it's, it, and I think it's not just a matter of uh, uh, timing of which technologies come out with, but really the, the context in which technologies are created. Um, and so my, my favorite historical example of this is, is nuclear power, which now, you know, it's like, you think of it, it's like, I don't like this, you think of it, you associate it with the atomic bomb. Um, and you could sort of imagine the world where, uh, they created nuclear power reactors before they created the atomic bomb. And so people were first introduced to, uh, sort of like atomic based technology, uh, in the context of cheap power, as opposed to death and destruction. And, uh, we, we may live, be living in a very different world today. Um, and so sort of thinking about how to use technologies for something beneficial first, um, can really shape how people respond to it. Yeah. I think the differential technology angle of like, you know, preferentially accelerating those applications that, you know, people th that, that we want, uh, I think is, uh, is a good angle to have. And, and, and even just that enculturation of like, you know, building high trust teams that are more transdisciplinary than you usually have is I think also really important just on the long run, you know, when, when risks pop up, people need to be able to cooperate. Uh, and I think doing that early, um, when stakes are low, um, is potentially another collateral benefit that could pop out, pop out of it. Um, okay, great. So, um, yeah, I, I love that we, uh, that we, that we tackled that, that risk angle too. Um, I think, you know, the long term is, uh, critique is definitely always like, you know, center of mind. If, if we want to have a really long future, which all of these things matter, then uh, we need to, we need to get there too. Um, so 
you know, now that we, I guess, have a few examples uh, on our hand, um, you know, those are not theoretical, right? You guys are working on it uh, day to day. So could you maybe talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how does that look like? Uh, what are current bottlenecks here? You know, what are, yeah, like, how does it look like? Let's say, you know, if, if you were recruiting me, Ben, you need more program managers, right? Like, what would I be doing? Um, what's the current bottleneck that you're facing? And yeah, uh, and, and how could I help? Uh, so, so very concretely, it's like wake up in the morning, uh, you read some, some papers that you think might hit at an exciting area, uh, like, like, you know, very like research papers. Um, and then you contact the authors and you say, oh, I saw your, your research paper was really interesting. Like, like, let's talk about like extensions of that or like what, what are, are your bottlenecks, uh, as, as the researcher, um. And then like, who else should I talk to? What other papers should I read? And sort of like do this, what I don't call it, like almost like a graph exploration of, of people, um, all the while sort of paying attention to like, who, who is it like sort of excited to work, who's excited about the actual research as opposed to like, just getting more funding to publish more papers. Um, you know, who, who has, has a vision, um, which things seem promising, which, which they, people do you talk to or are sort of working at complementary things, but maybe don't know about each other and sort of like building up, uh, this both in your mind and then like sort of fleshing it out in what I would almost call like a, a proto roadmap or what have you. Um, and then, uh, sort of figuring out like who are the, like the relevant people then, uh, start running workshops to sort of get people to like uh, slam ideas against each other, right? Like it's very easy to go from person to person and like have all these floating ideas that what you really want to do is sort of like get a synthesis. Um, and then eventually sort of really coming up with a, a, a plan. It's like, okay, like I want to, uh, fund these people to do these things. Um, and so that's, that's sort of like the, the day to day of starting a, uh, a perfect pr program. Um, and so if that sounds interesting to people, uh, then you should get in touch. Yeah. That's very similar also to how we think about finding FRO sort of founding teams. Um, the FROs are also constrained in, in some other ways. I mean, it really has to be not good as a startup because then you should just go and do a startup. <laughs> um, it really has to be not um, doable as an academic project, we should just do that. Um, and yet it has to be sort of intrinsically motivating. I think there's, I think there's no way around it. Um, certainly if you're creating new industries, you know, we're at the ground floor of something and so on, but, but, you know, th these are nonprofits and really the purpose is to do projects. You really have to have people that have been itching to do a project, you know, for the last 10 years or something and not found a way to do that. And then have that then have the right shape. Um, have those people be at the right place and the right time to get involved in that. And then have the overall project that you create in terms of the kinds of, um, job opportunities that it has transition plans and so on that can come out of it, um, be appealing also, um, to recruit that team. Um, so I think that froze have in some ways a little bit more, maybe more hurdle, um, Parpa has to get a really good program manager. And then probably there are going to be a decent number of researchers that are willing, tell me if this is wrong, Ben, there'll be a decent number of researchers that you can find somewhere willing in their own homes to, to work on that program. The fro has a, a bit of a hurdle, but at the same time, I don't think there have to be thousands and thousands of fro's. I think that we, what we want to do is for each field find, uh, and taking into account differential technology development and other types of ethical types of issues and so on, we want to find what are maybe the dozen or so, you know maybe a few dozen fro shaped bottlenecks, um, across fields and then, and then create ones for those. Um, and so you have to solve this problem, but you don't have to solve it thousands and thousands of times. You maybe have to solve it a few dozen times, um, collectively, both with our organizations and with what other funders and other people end up doing with their own interpretation of that concept. Um, because this fro idea really also is just like a meme. Um, uh, and even the ARPA program idea is, is in some ways just a meme. It's, it's something that you want people to start organizing around, but it doesn't have to be completely, you know, narrowly defined when it's done by other people. Okay. So that's, you know, if I was potentially, 
um, a program manager, or, you know, like a leader of that project. And, you know, if let's say someone who's more on the funding side is, li is listening to this, right. Um, I know that you have the exact structures uh, of your organizations, which are, you know, have quite a complex like legal angle, uh, you know, to tackle this complex, <laughs> um, uh, to tackle this really complex, innovative space on your websites. Uh, but, you know, as a funder, you know, like philanthropic money, investing money, like, you know, what's interesting here uh, uh, from that, from that perspective. Uh, so I think the way that I set up Parpa at least is, is this sort of like three it, it, to, to try to uh, appeal to the minute is from a, 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 for a funders. So there's like, um, it's, it, if the funder found like the sort of like the concept of the organization itself interesting, like we can, we have a nonprofit entity, um, and, and, uh, but at the same time, like I, I understand that it's like sort of like weird and new and often people want to fund, uh, like no, sort of know what they're, they're funding. And so the, the approach we're taking is to really sort of fund programs, uh, on a program by program basis. Um, and then. At the same time, uh, we, we've also set up, set up a, a for-profit entity, which is, is basically there as a, a holding company for like, if like way down the road, uh, it ends up be making sense that like the, the way you can almost imagine that like, uh, like a, a program becomes a fro and then at the end of the fro, they're like, okay, like there's, there's like actually a, a business here. Um, and the best way to get the technology into the world is by, by starting a business around it, which, which like eventually is, is often the case. Uh, we, we've set up a, a for-profit entity to, uh, sort of capture some of that value, both to feed it back into the, the research and to, uh, potentially make a return for, for funders. Um, and so that's, there's sort of like those, those three avenues, um, and, and the bet there is like, well, this is probably a big zero. But if we manage to invent an industry, uh, then it will not be. There'll be many big zeros past, <laughs> like after different numbers. <laughs> uh, Adam, how about you? Yeah, well, so for Froze, you know, there's a couple of parallel efforts. So, so we, we are, um, you know, I, I got into this partly through Tom Khalil, who you both know, um, who's been involved in many national science initiatives in the past, um, like the Brain Initiative and the National Nanotechnology Initiative. And, uh, we published a white paper through the day one project whose purpose is to try to get the government basically to be exposed to good science and technology policy type ideas. So there, there's one possibility the government could eventually fund froze as a kind of alternative mechanism for, for some of the things that it does. Um, but mostly I'm thinking about philanthropists and, and I think that froze are actually a very good match for philanthropists because they're very goal driven. So, so rather than saying, Hey, I'm going to endow, you know, this university, this department, this general field of neuroscience or something like that, you know, for the brain mapping project, we'd be saying, you know, this is a tool that we're going to develop in five years that if it works, uh, and we're going to tightly manage it and drive it so that it's, everything is focused on getting that to work. And if it works, it's going to lift all the boats in neuroscience, but in this very well-defined way. Um, so you're really, it's more like, um, a, it, it, in a not-for-profit sense, it's it's more like a, a, a well, a very well-defined product, right? right? It's sort of here's what here's what you get out. Um, I think that in in principle, um, a lot of philanthropists, including ones that have made their money on kind of big tech businesses or sort of executing uh, milestone-driven businesses or things like that, they would they would rather than just supporting a general amorphous area or cause area, they could say, well, we really get we really get the ten x speed up in brain mapping from this project. Um, you know, in a defined period of time. So I think it could be a very good match for philanthropists across various areas. Yeah, that coordination hurdle, I think, is a hard one. Like, especially even when people, you know, newly join our foresight groups and they're like, I want to help, but like, what are other people doing? Who's where? And right. some things are conditional on others. Like, like is there a plan? Um, and so I think, you know, Kurnit's done really quite essential decentralized and, and, and by really the goodwill of lots of people in the space that take a lot of time to onboard people <laughs> into the mix. Um, you know, but I think by, with some coordination, we could uh, definitely, um, streamline and, and speed up a few things there perhaps. Um, okay. Uh, maybe as you know, my last, uh, question here, um, as a big one, um, you know, what, like, you know, take us a little bit like on a walk, like what would failure or success look like? I mean, those 
two things are, you know, you have two hypotheses, you're training them and testing them in the wild, right? Um, and like, what would it look like, you know, let's say in, in five to 10 years, if you, th if you said, okay, actually like, yeah, probably I wasn't quite right. Uh, this is not really the way that, uh, that, that, that we hit the, uh, that we hit the amazing sci-fi futures that we want. But on the other hand, also, what would it look like if you're like, oh, well, this was extremely successful, perhaps not only in terms of the individual technology areas that uh, you're focusing on, but also in terms of maybe creating, you know, um, broader scale, you know, change in the scientific ecosystem as a whole, if that is anything that you care about uh, at all, or you know, maybe it is just that you want to focus on this one tech and, and it should just get done and we want to just, you know, run off. Maybe it is that you're aiming a little bit more of it as a, you know, uh, yeah, as a collateral, um, uh, collateral influence on the entire ecosystem too. Anyway, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, <laughs> but here are a few options. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, for, for, for the FROs, I think they, first of all, they should be part of a broader ecosystem. Again, there's only a very small minority of problems that probably has that exact right shape. But if we have FROs and PARPA and several other new sort of diversifications of, of the ecosystem, then, you know, one thing that I think would be great, you know, if you're, you're graduating your, your grad school or you're, you've been working in, in a, in a company for a while, you're thinking, what's the next big thing that I should do that, you know, this uh, doing a fro is like on the table for you. Like, right, like right now, if you want to do a scientific sort of medium scale kind of mega project, like, like Endeavor, um, you know, unless you're the director of the Allen Institute or, or Genelia or the NIH or something like that, it's very hard to contemplate. And the, again, there's this huge coordination barrier. How would you even conceive of finding the funders for that? How would you find co-founders for that? They're all doing something else or so on. And so if we provide this locus that like a fro could just be an option <laughs> uh, that, you know, and people take that seriously, or maybe even go from one to the next, um, that would be really good. You will throw entrepreneurs. I love it. Yeah. Ben, what about you? <laughs> and so in terms of success, I, I think honestly having one program that people to look at and say like, oh, that, that actually made something happen that would not otherwise have happened. I sort of think of this as this bending S curves. So you think of like an S curve and, you know, everybody sort of looks at it and it's in the, before, it, before it's at the steep part, it's just sort of like flat and you, people look at it and imagine that it's going to be like that forever. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, like there's some intervention and it, it sort of picks up steep. Um, so that would be, that would be, I think one level of success. Another level of success would be people starting, uh, sort of like similar organizations to go after many different areas. Uh, so, so I, 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 I think. So I believe strongly about research organizations is that they, they don't scale like startup companies. And so you really can't have uh, a, a really massive one. And so what you need to do is have many different ones. Um, and then sort of at the, at the ecosystem level, uh, I, I also think about new research organizations as sort of putting pressure on the legacy institutions in the sense that uh, if all of a sudden you start seeing FROs and, and PARPA and other things sort of having results um, that, you know, it's like national labs and universities are not, uh, then you, you'll start to, to get pressure on people to be like, oh, like, what could we do better, right? Like, so um, uh, I'm actually optimistic that the existing institutions can, can do better, but I think that you sort of need almost like a little bit of competitive pressure to, to change that. So, so that's another sort of optimistic scenario. Um, it literally just looks like either like the, the things that are successful just being things that would, would have been funded anyway, or like would it just sort of would have gotten there anyway. Um, or simply just like, you know, you, you try to, to get these things out the ground and it sort of ends up being a big nothing burger. Yeah, I really feel you on the S curves. I think, you know, like one thing that is interesting working for Foresight is like when I go into our archives, you know, 30 years ago, people were like really gung ho on much of the technology that we're now discussing. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, there was, there seemed to be like another, like little bit of a, of a dip of a winter, you know, especially, I mean, in lots of fields, you know, but from molecular machines, even to biotech and longevity, and especially 
what you saw with longevity really just kicked off. Um, I think since COVID, then lots of crypto money coming in. And and now suddenly it was always this thing that was obviously going to happen. But I really remember just like three, four years ago when you tell people about it and would just be like, yeah, this is nuts. Um, and 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 so it's 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 really hard on the other end, on the other side, to remember how it was just before, like a few years ago. Yeah. And suddenly, the Genome every- isn't even the biggest project in longevity anymore. But a year ago, it seemed like, gosh, wow, that's nigh impossible that that would ever work. <laughs> and, you, and you see this throughout history, uh, like autonomous cars are are another example where like people have been working on them. Like now, now everybody thinks of like autonomous cars as, as the future, but like. Uh, in, in the early 2000s, before the DARPA Grand Challenge, it was just like this weird esoteric research area that people have been working on for decades. Same thing with neural nets, right? Like everybody's like, oh, AI. But, you know, before uh, before the early uh, 2010s, neural nets, like pe- pe- people like couldn't get money to to fund their research. And I feel like mostly with, I mean, longevity is now almost like a no-brainer, but I think with molecular machines, certainly that they're still... I think we're still in that stage where probably in the next two to three, maybe even five years, that's when people will catch on and they're like, oh, and that's when that new wave will come. And again, it will like, as an S-curve does, you know, like wither out and then we'll just have to strap our seatbelts on and kind of plow through while the next kind of phase. I agree. Those the people key- want us to stay for 20 years in those fields because eventually they kick off. But yeah. the, the, the key thing is that it's not inevitable. This is the thing that I want to flag and like the reason that at least I'm doing what I'm doing and. And Adam, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you feel similarly is that at the same time, like, like it's easy to sort of like look back at these successes and say like, oh, it was, it was inevitable. Um, but you should also look back, uh, throughout history and see all these things that, uh, just sort of actually die, right? Like, um, you know, it's like, like, uh, nuclear powered airplanes or, um, steam powered cars. Uh, there's sort of all these, and, and you, like, you can always make an argument for like why the technology was fundamentally unsuitable, but I, I think you could equally make an argument that like, well, you know, it just didn't have its like escrow bending moment, um, because so it didn't do an intervention. So the, the thing is that like, it, it's worth being really optimistic about, but it's not something that it will just, ha- it, it doesn't just happen on its own. People need to like do things and have opinions and like push these things forward. Sorry. I can't wait until the next podcast in 20 years when someone will have totally proven you wrong and use it as an example for why those things are actually amazing technologies that we always needed. <laughs> but but this is exactly, I think, you know, what you what you guys are trying to do, just like, you know, speed up that discovery process, like that meta discovery process of finding out what actually is in the bucket of s and what is in the bucket of like, you know, <laughs> withering out. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, I cannot wait until we have um, a continuation of this podcast, uh, maybe in, uh, you know, in uh, 10 years and, you know, we'll just check back in on the progress and, you know, we'll evaluate the experiment. Like, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting, you know, I guess about um, the foster community, like when, when I came in like, and looked into our archives, people have a really long breath, you know, like so many folks that are still, you know, are, are now in our working groups, they've been at this for so long. And, and now I think it's kind of on, uh, you know, on, on us to just pay it forward and also just be patient uh, and, and plow away as, you know, uh, as like, you know, new memes arise, like, uh, and as new people move in and they move out again, you know, like bubbles <laughs> will burst. Uh, but I think that on the long run, um, yeah, I'm super just really excited to look back at this meta experiment um, uh, in, in, in 10 to 20 years, then we'll probably have a variety of different froze papers uh, and, and other children spun out from various, um, from various, yeah, geniuses that are just being born as we speak. <laughs> um, all right. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Foresight, also a meta experiment, I would say in that same, same category. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, okay. Well, thank you guys. I, I really like this. Uh, yeah, this was quite uplifting, quite ex hopey. Um, I'm hoping that people check out your individual websites. Do you just want to say one word about how best to find you? Um, and then we can wrap it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ben underscore Reinhardt. Yep. Uh, first name, last name, uh, Twitter or dot com. Uh, no link. Dot word, rather. <laughs> I'm already excited what people will use, which which social system they will use uh, next time we'll speak. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Well, thank you so, so much for joining. Um, and thank yeah. Thank you for having us.